Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas. I am Harsha Nikhar and this talk is about actions have consequences, the overlooked security risks in third party GitHub actions given by our speaker Yaron Avital. Uh, I have a few announcements before we begin. We would like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor Adobe and our gold sponsor Prisma Cloud, Blue Cat, Toyota. It's with their support along with our other sponsors, donors and volunteers that make this event possible. These talks are being live streamed and as a courtesy to our speakers and audience, we ask that you check to make sure your cell phones are set to silent. If you have any questions, please use the audience microphone so that YouTube can hear you as well. And with that, let's begin and get started. Please welcome our speaker. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Yaona Vital. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Really excited to be here. Uh, I'm a security researcher at Palo Alto, and I have about 15 years of experience in the cybersecurity space, both as a developer and uh, a security researcher. Uh, previously, I worked at cybersecurity, uh, where uh, we created, uh, we were focused on uh, sorry, uh, CI/CD security. And we created a fairly popular uh, break the bill CI/CD goat. So if you want to learn how to hack pipelines, this is the project for you. You can search it up in uh, Google or GitHub. Uh, Palo Alto acquired the cyber security about six months ago. So I've been working since uh, ever since. Now in today's talk, we're going to talk about GitHub Actions uh, and the problematic permissions model of GitHub Actions, which in my mind encourage users to make mistakes security-wise. Uh, and uh, what would have been a very profound mitigation that uh, simply has a significant loophole in it. Uh, I'm going to show you su surprising statistics from uh, analyzing open source projects across the globe and a few takeaways so you can better uh, defend your uh, projects. So GitHub Actions is a very popular CICD platform by uh, GitHub, which allows you to build, test, and deploy your code automatically. And it has a very rich and extensive third party action marketplace. Uh, you can think of an action as a software package that instead of developing the logic, in, in, de developing the logic inside your workflow, you can simply uh, use the uh, action from the marketplace. Now, most of the actions are developed uh, by the community and not by GitHub. And everyone basically can write their own code and post it as an action in the marketplace. So what initiated this research is actually me uh, analyzing, going over build logs of public projects. Uh, it's a hobby of mine, don't judge. And I noticed a phenomenon where um, benign action uh, developed by unknown developer basically has full-blown permissions against the repository. And I wanted to see exactly what is the root cause and why it is, it, it is so widespread. So let us begin with a quote by GitHub where it states, there is significant risk in sourcing actions from third-party repositories on GitHub. Now, that sounds pretty severe to me. Uh, let's see how the GitHub users handle this uh, warning. So the way things work in GitHub Actions, every time a workflow starts or a job to be precise, GitHub creates a short-lived token called the GitHub token in order for the workflow to be able to interact with the repository. Now we can set permissions to the uh, GitHub token in the uh, workflow YAML file, either by specifying permissions for the entire uh, workflow or for a specific job. We can set uh, permissions for the, all of the scopes or particular ones. So GitHub does a pretty good job uh, providing options to um, specifying permissions. But if you don't set permissions inside your workflow, the default permissions of the organization or the repo will kick in, which used to be right on all scopes up until February 2023. Uh, only then GitHub realized it's probably way too permissive and decided to change it to read only, but they didn't change it for existing uh, organizations, only for new ones, because I guess they didn't want to break uh, builds across the globe, uh, which leaves the vast majority of uh, projects on GitHub having right permission to this very day. Now let's review more of the sensitive scopes uh, we can assign to GitHub Actions. Contents being the obvious one allows the workflow to push new code to the repository. 
ID token which allows you work for to authenticate, to authenticate against a cloud provider like AWS or Azure on your behalf via the OIDC protocol. Packages which allow the workflow to upload new packages, um, administrate that part of the repository, uh, packages that will be consumed later by the production environment or your, by your customers. And lastly, we have actions which allow the administration of the GitHub Actions part of the uh, repository. Now let's review an attacker uh, com trying to compromise a third party GitHub action. It can happen in attacks like command injection or uh, repo jacking or many other techniques out there. And if you're thinking, uh, what are the chances I get compromised? It rarely ever happens. So uh, my colleague Asi, who sits here in the audience, just gave an awesome talk yesterday about how he managed to uh, take over uh, third party action by the thousands. So these things happen all the time. And uh, our attacker here can push after he uh, took over the third party GitHub action, can push a new malicious code, which will then be executed inside the pipeline, which will, in, in, in fact, uh, poison the workflow. And from there, he can reach all the way to the repository or the production environment. OK, so now that we understand the risks, let's try to reduce uh, the attack surface by managing the permissions correctly. So let's say I'm a developer, I'd like to use a third party GitHub action. My boss told me uh, it's a good idea to have more AI in my project because AI is the big, best uh, big thing. So I'm heading down to the actions, a marketplace, search something with AI, and I found this, open commit, improve commits with AI. Sounds brilliant, exactly what I needed. But there is no place here on the marketplace place page or the repo page where I can see the permission this action requires. Uh, so in order to set the permissions correctly. Uh, now, in GitHub ecosystem, we have a concept called a GitHub app where I can approve the permission and I get actually getting prompt to approve permissions, but it's not the case here. All I have to do to use this action is basically copy a snippet of the uh, action name and I can run it inside my workflow without specifying anything. So this was my exact reaction when I saw this, like where are the permission I need? So I've decided to develop a tool that does exactly that called Piper. It's a shortcut for pipeline and permissions. And what it does, it can take any third party action, do a static code analysis on the code, and finally outputting the exact permission it needs, no more, no less, by analyzing the usage of the code against the repository. Let's see a few more examples. Here, here we have the OctaKit, which is a client by uh, GitHub, very popular one, enabling, which enables the repository to interact with the repository, with the workflow sorry, to interact with the repository. And we can see here that it uses a pull request, so I can derive from that what the permission it needs. Furthermore, I can interact, there are many ways to interact with the repository, you have a REST API, uh, Bash, GraphQL. So I've written a lot of uh, static, uh, static code analysis rules, mapping all the usages against, to the, against the repository, and I know, I, I know exactly the permission it needs. So after I wrote Piper, I decided I wanted to see how the major public repositories, major public open source projects are handling permissions in GitHub. Uh, so I took the 2,000 repos, which had 6,000 workflows and 1,000 unique actions from the top starred open source GitHub projects. All the big names are here. We will see uh, in a moment. And I wanted to see exactly how they manage permissions, so I, I've created a database uh, of actions and their permissions using Piper. And I've, uh, I'll... Um, went over and an analyzed the workflows and extracted the actions they use and the granted permissions by taking a look at the build logs you can see on the right. Uh, each time a workflow on, it prints basically all the uh, permission it needs in the build log. So once I have that, I can compare granted permissions versus required permissions. And I found this insane number of 93% of the uh, open source projects, the big ones, 
doesn't even manage their permissions. Uh, no one basically doing it right out there, having at least one excessive uh, workflow permissions. Also, I found out that 50% of the action doesn't even uh, you, uh, require GitHub token in order to operate. Like, uh, if you take, for example, Slack Notify, with the sole purpose of sending a Slack message from the workflow, it doesn't do any interaction with the repository, it doesn't need permissions. Yet again, in uh, a lot of time, having uh, full one permissions against the repository. Same goes for set of Python and many other actions who does not require the GitHub token from the first place. And all you have to do in order to mitigate the risk is simply set the permissions to none, like this. Another interesting figure I found is that 94% of the action actually use three scopes, up to three scopes, out of 15 available, leaving the more dangerous one uh, aside. Uh, issues, pull requests, and quantities read being the more popular ones. And this is another slide that blew my mind. This is actually the essence of the, this research. We can see here open source projects we all use, uh, Microsoft, Cloudflare, and Airbnb, granting write all permissions, again, on all scopes to benign action, nobody knows, uh, maintained by a private developer with low number of stars. You can see the stars on the right. Uh, I'm sure Microsoft is putting a lot of time and effort to manage their employee uh, permissions against uh, SEMs. But here, we can see uh, just uh, an unknown developer on the, on the internet. Sure, let him have every permission he wants, basically. So to mitigate the risks, we have a concept that is called action pinning, which is recommended by GitHub. And uh, what GitHub actually means by that is that we pin against a certain commit hash of the action. So that uh, will ensure that I will always work with a safe version of the action. Now the way to do so is not by pinning to a branch, as we can see on the first row, or to a release tag. The only proper way to do so is to use the full commit hash, as we can see on the last row. Now, going back to the drawing, let's see uh, another. Let's see a, what happens if an attacker will try to overtake this action this time. So we have a workflow, and we are pinned against a certain uh, commit hash in the green. But our attacker can come, push a new uh, malicious code after he took over the third party GitHub action, of course but it won't have any effect on the workflow because we are always taking the uh, commit hash in green. So this is supposed to have a complete remediation over an attacker compromising a third party action, right? Well, this is wrong as I've discovered doing my research actually. Uh, and I want to introduce you a concept that is called the unpinnable actions, uh, which I came up with. Uh, Actions that, even if pinned, can still have devastating results once compromised over the workflow. So let's consider this uh, workflow, a very simple one. It's a workflow named CI, and it uses an action you can see below uh, called an pinnable action with a full commit hash, as it should. However, for the first time it ran, it printed out hello world, but in the second time, I've got pawned. So how it's even possible if the workflow hasn't changed and um, pinned against the commit hash, so the actions code hasn't changed, how is it even possible? So I will teach you the trick, I will teach you the trick in a moment, but uh, for us to have a better understanding, let's do a quick recap on the uh, type of actions. So just a moment. So we have three types of actions. We have the JavaScript action, which allows me to write uh, in JavaScript or TypeScript and the actions code. It's very popular. We have the Octokit client I just showed you. Now, if I require more heavy lifting, uh, certain operating system or uh, dependencies, I can use the Docker container action. And lastly, we have the composite actions, which allows me to write bash inside the YAML file or uh, simply use another action within the YAML file so I can call another action. And it's very, um, it's very good for uh, short operations. Uh, going back to the workflow we just saw, so here we have the commit hash. 
and moving on to the repository's code of the action, uses the same hash, so that means it cannot change. But what we have here is actually this action pulls the latest tag of a Docker image from container registry, which completely voids the, uh, the pinning. Because latest tag is mutable, and it's com the complete opposite of the concept. So basically, it means that every time this action will run, it will pull the latest tag, and the new code will be introduced inside my workflow. So going back to the drawing one last time, here we have the same workflow pinned against the commit hash, but our attacker this time can take another approach and try to take over the Docker container registry of this uh, action and push a new uh, image, image tag, the latest image tag, which will then run inside the third party GitHub action, which all the way to the workflow, and from there, you know the drill to the repository or the production environment. Now, what I just saw you is not uh, one scenario. I can show you in each of every uh, type of action how to do so, how to escape the pinning. Uh, another way to write a Docker container action is to supply a Docker file, file. And here we can see unlock packages, Python packages in this example, without requir requirements txt, uh, which uh, again violates the concept of pinning. Here we can see download and installation of third party uh, binaries without checksum. Now moving on to the composite actions, we can see here our action uses another action, but in an unpinned way. So again, it's uh, actually tampered with the pinning mechanism. You can see here uh, another example of how can we escape pinning with uh, pulling a mutable tag. And here we have an NPM installation, again, without locking. Uh, an, uh, 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 JavaScript package. And lastly, we have JavaScript, which uh, action, which the situation there is slightly better because there are no runtime installation of packages, but we can still fetch uh, resources scripts from the outside world and by that actually temper with the pinning. So, I love numbers, so I took 1,000 uh, actions, again, top start actions from the marketplace, and found out that 32% 30 of them actually are unpinnable, what I, which I call them. So it's not surprising to see that 67% of the uh, workflows that do pin their actions, they have done the uh, heavy lifting of calculating the checksum, uh, are pinning against an unpinnable action. That's an insane number. Basically, a lot of workflows out there can be compromised. A uh, few takeaways so you'll be able to defend yourself before we end this talk. Is, uh, basic, this is very basic. You can set the default workflow permissions inside your organization, GitHub organization, to read instead of the permissive write. Specify exact permissions inside your workflow file. Now, GitHub, just in time for this talk, released a tool, it's still in public beta, that uh, enables you to calculate the uh, actions, the permission you needed for each action. Uh, same like Piper, but they took a different approach. They are uh, installing a proxy, it's a little bit more intrusive. Now, this we haven't covered during this talk, but you can uh, isolate actions to different uh, jobs, because uh, job runs in containerized environment if one job gets compromised, it won't affect the other. And lastly, do pin your actions. Uh, it's not a perfect mechanism, but it's better than nothing. And uh, you can use a cool open source project called Ratchet to do the pinning automatically on your workflows. And if you do find a third party action you would like to use, which is unpinnable, you can always fork it, lock it, and uh, change it from there. And uh, to conclude this talk, Let's uh, end with a quote by uh, the late Ronald Reagan, which said about GitHub Actions, don't trust and verify. Thank you. If you have any questions. Sure. There's a lot 
of similarities between GitHub Actions dependencies and standard, like node packages, Python packages, which already have their own set of problems. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's anything that GitHub should be learning from what we've already learned in those spaces with poisoning to secure this supply chain? Yeah, I think the GitHub should uh, handle uh, third-party action as a, as a whole, not to do stuff maybe at runtime if it's possible. I know that it's, I think it's in their roadmap to maybe have a binary instead of a third-party action, which will uh, block for many runtime installations and which allow the escaping of the ping. Uh, Follow-up question. So I know that I think it's Google or somebody has a like a, a group out there for like open source projects that are too big to fail, which need like you know additional monitoring and security and whatnot. Do you think that these actions that are widely used should be a candidate for that pool of you know express open source security uh, evaluation, right, to make sure they don't get poisoned? Yeah. So basically, there are a lot of uh, mitigations you can do uh, when you're using a third-party GitHub action. Um, starting from uh, blocking network uh, to the outside world, uh, blocking the attackers from um, uh, interacting with the CNC, and um, um, the obvious thing will be to vet the code of the action before you use it and try to see if it's really pinned or not. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, you, you mentioned that you uh, use static analysis to analyze necessary permissions for the actions. Yeah. Uh, have you encountered any, any tools that would use static analysis to just uh, assess the risk of the third party action? Uh, actually, no, because it's pretty specific to uh, analyze uh, third party GitHub action on its own. I'm not looking for vulnerabilities. In, in the case of Piper, the tool I wrote, I specifically checked for usages so I can map those to permissions. Are you, are you aware of any uh, exploitation that has uh, occurred using this method? Yes, of course. Uh, basically, my team and I are doing several um, disclosures uh, a month for major projects. Uh, by attacking uh, the dependencies, so it happens all the time, yes. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Anand. It was a very good talk.